Tired of the everyday grind? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape. Escape. Transcribed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are groping your way through the belly of a sunken ship, a fortune and pearl secured to your belt. While above on the ship that tends you, working the pump that sends air to you, is an adversary whose plans include the taking of your pearls and your life. Listen now as Escape brings you John Russell's story, The Adversary. It was at dusk and on an ebb tide that the purling schooner Fancy Free came smartly up into the wind and dropped anchor in the harbor of Thursday Island. And it was after dark when her master came ashore and paid off his Kanaka crew. He was a big man, this captain, with a crop of black hair, a smooth, long jaw, and gray eyes. As he went swinging along the waterfront, the crowd parted right and left before him. Now... News of any arrival travels fast on Thursday Island, and with such a figure as this, the conversation at the Portuguese bar had been going on for some time. One thing I know for certain, he's got the trimmest lugger in these parts. And where's he from, Smike? First time I ever laid eye on him or his boat was this evening. If he was from these parts, Portuguese, Captain Smike would know him. Well, wherever he from... He'd be like the rest of you, up to no good. Oh, you've no use for pearlers, have you, Portuguese? You're all cut from the same cloth. Thieves, drunkards, brawlers, and worse. Ah, you fat devil. You're better than the worst of us. I know and can account for my shortcomings. It is not so with you who make a living like so many sea gypsies. What's he saying, Captain Smike? Alf, drink your drink. I only wanted to know. The stranger, Smike. He's another pearler, perhaps. Yes, he could be. Uh, I'll find out more when he comes for his rum. Yeah. Pour me a drink, Portuguese. And one for little Alfie. Yeah. A toast to Thursday Island. Thursday Island. Where the only honest man to grace its shores came by land. <laughs> <laughs> you there, at the bar. Cool. Look at the size of that one. My name is Smike, if it's me you're talking to. My name is Weatherby. John Weatherby. I'm master of the fancy free. That's the lugger in the arbor, ain't it? And so, Captain Weatherby... I've come to spend some time with you. Captain Weatherby, what is your pleasure? Rum, but first I'll have my say. That's your right. A moment back you drank a toast to which I take exception. That's so. You said the only honest man on Thursday Island came by land. I did. Now then, I don't mind what you call yourselves to yourselves. As long as I'm in your midst, anyone that says I'm not honest and can't prove it I'll knock the seven bells out of him. Since you're a stranger here, Weatherby, I'll tell you something. I'm senior captain on Thursday Island. And I say what I wish when I wish. And it's like I said before. The only honest man on Thursday Island came... <laughs> by... Lummy, he never even got it said. You, little fellow... Go give your friend a hand. He'll need help for a while yet. My name is Alf, and I ain't finished my drink. Go. Yes, sir. Now, I'll have that rum. Right away, Captain Weatherby. Mm. 
Now, on Thursday Island, there was no prying into a neighbor's affairs unless one was prepared to push the inquiry with a knife. And so it was that nobody questioned where Weatherby came from, or his purling license, or the motley crew he picked to replace the skilled Kanaka boys he'd let go. His new cook was Chinese, his head diver a Manila man, and his mate a giant North African who went by the name of Buttermilk. But questions or no, as the months passed, a legend was growing about Captain Weatherby. Oh, he'd chase you right across the Pacific to pay your tuppence he might owe you. That's his sort. You never had tuppence in your life, Alfie. Five nights ago, he was in here, and he drank five hard cases under the table. And when they left, he squared the whole bill himself. Honest Witherby, they call him. Honest Witherby, he's up to something. They say nothing but good about him. You're right as rain, Portuguese. Last month, he stayed in quarantine, voluntary-like, just because of that island steamer and the cholera scare. Then paid his crew their monthly wages anyway. His crew. A good master wouldn't allow a one of them to set foot on deck. Well, they ain't been exactly trained by the Queen's Navy. What I want to know is this. Why has he got the fastest lugger in these parts manned by that collection of trash? You still hold that blow against Weatherby, Smythe. But he's all right. Arbor authorities, pilots, and other masters, and the whole lot. They all like I him. I don't. Listen, that will be the Brisbane steam. Oh, it's trying to get her bloody passengers back aboard. She sails at midnight. Australia. I wish I was going. I'd like to see Australia again. Yes, they'd probably like to see you, too. Oh, now, Captain. <laughs> Like as not, it's her pilot the Fanshaw's blowing for. Pilot? Ever since she put in here, Weatherby and that ship's pilot been trying to drink the island dry. I wonder where he is now. Down at the docks, like as not. Pouring his pilot friend aboard the steamer. Another rum, Portuguese. And another for little Alfie. And in truth, Weatherby was down at the docks his coat turned up against the squalls that were blowing wet from the ocean. He was standing in the shadows by some packing crates, watching from a distance the yellow cargo flares that showed the loading of the Fernshaw was still in progress. Then, just as Captain Weatherby was turning away, another figure slipped from the shadow and moved to confront him. Uh, Captain Weatherby? Yes? I'll take Harvers, if you please, Captain Weatherby. What? I said harvest. Now, don't move, Captain. I've got you well covered, and I'm not afraid to shoot. Deacon! After all these years, the Deacon! Bless me if I didn't think I'd done you in. I should have died, but I didn't. No thanks to you. And what are you doing on Thursday Island? I dropped in from Samurai, meaning to catch the Brisbane steamer. Huh? I've been doing some diving up the way, but I'm only a fair diver, and my luck's been poor until tonight. Until tonight? And why the change, little beetle? Because I chanced to see you, my old friend. And I was strolling along the front, and I made inquiries, and I heard what they call you in these parts. Honest Weatherby. Why, you wasp. You have it in mind to blow on me? To tell what I know of you and have you go to jail, not a chance. That would do me no good. What then? I just want half of your new speculation. Your latest deviltry. Uh, what makes you think I've got a plan, Deacon? Oh, you know, do you think I couldn't smell it out? I know your methods too well. Fine public character, no suspicion, alibi all complete. Yes, and I also know you sneaked your crew out of town tonight. Your lugger's ready to slip cable this minute. And most important, I happen to know what the furniture's carrying aboard her this trip. Oh, the devil you do. The season sweep of pearls. 20,000 pounds worth. Suppose I was after those pearls. How would I get them? That's for you to do. And me to profit by. Oh, so you'll let me do the dirty and then take arbors. That's right, right Captain Honest Weatherby. Blast me if it isn't hard to know whether you're with me or against me, Deacon. Thus saith the Lord. An adversary there shall be and he shall bring down thy strength <laughs> from thee. <laughs> All right. All right then, Deacon, I'll put up with your blackmail and piracy. And I'll take you on as an adversary. And you'll be part of the enterprise. Good, good. And now, Weatherby, tell me this. How are you to get the pearls that are aboard the steamer there? Thank 
I shall have to dive for them, Deacon. Dive for them? And like it or not, since you've declared yourself in, you'll be a party to it. <laughs> you mean you're going to sink her? That's exactly what I mean, Deacon. Within two hours of sailing, the fern shore will be resting on the bottom of the passage. You are listening to The Adversary, tonight's presentation of Escape. It's back again. It's Saturday daytimes on CBS Radio. It's romance. Romance every Saturday on most of these same stations bringing you the world's great love stories, some new, some old, all fascinating adventures in listening. The story this Saturday, Daphne de Maurier's celebrated novel, Frenchman's Creek, dramatizes the love of a noblewoman for a pirate. And now, escape and the second act of The Adversary. Within half an hour, the little lugger Fancy Free was standing out to sea. The master, Captain Weatherby, and a small and shivering passenger sheltered in the lee of the deckhouse. The deacon had wanted in on the profit, but he had hardly counted on mass murder as a means to it. One man's death he might have countenanced, but to murder a steamer was something else. Weatherby, you can't do it. You can't drown a whole ship's company. Did you ever hear the Volga, the Kate, or the Mecca? Well, they all fell a trifle off the track. Their bottoms were ripped out on Tribulation Show. Now, the same thing might happen to the Fernshaw. But how? There's a light on Tribulation Show. So there is. It's a fourth-order fixed dioptric, unattended. Now, suppose that light were moved. But like you say, it's fixed, yeah. and besides, the keeper lives only a mile away on Horn Island. You couldn't move it. Suppose a man were to land on the lee of Tribulation Shoal, and with a canvas, blanket the light to westward. Now, if that same man were to take a discarded lightship lantern that he might have aboard his lugger, and after anchoring some half mile away, show this light at his masthead, <laughs> what then? What? You're mad, Weatherby. You begin to see the possibility for error. You you really are going to wreck her. Well, I am, Deacon. You, you wouldn't. You dare. Captain. What is it? Big surf head. Can hear. How far? Close. Very close. Deacon, get below. We're at Tribulation Shoal, and there's man's work to be done yet tonight. Uh, Weatherby. Get below. Buttermilk. Captain. How close now to the south? Two, three hundred yards. Have the helm put over, Buttermilk, and drop a hook. We're going ashore to have a look at Tribulation Light. Now, it is a fact that no one knows or is ever likely to know the actual explanation for the wreck of the Brisbane steamer, which left Thursday Island and came to grief some two hours later on Tribulation Shoal. But the records declare that she went clean off her course and a coral reef laid her open as neatly as a butcher's knife lays open a carcass. She sank within five minutes. The next morning, as the dawn spread in iridescence over those waters, Captain Weatherby anchored his lugger between the tips of the two sunken masts. All right, Buttermilk. Get my equipment ready. I get diving suit. <laughs> Well, Deacon, you'll note for yourself there's not a trace of evidence. We've not been spied. The lantern we used is sunk, the canvas destroyed, and tribulation light as it was before. You're evil, Weatherby, pure evil. Deacon, is there so much difference between a lot and a little? Come now, Deacon, cheer up. Here we are, and there are the pearls. 20,000 pounds worth of them, just over side. No, I don't want any part of them. And within three hours, I'll be back out on the purling banks about my business, never having heard of the wreck. Captain, you strap diving shoes. Next week, or any time I choose, I'll be walking the streets of Thursday near the news. And who will be as surprised as Captain Weatherby, that hard-working man? 
Honest Weatherby, with a fortune in his belt to dispose at leisure. Already now. Good helmet, Captain. Yes, Deacon. I have not a problem in the world. Except you. Me? Why me? You are evidence. This stinking crew doesn't matter. I've kept them too befuddled to know what's happening. But you, you could be Queen's evidence. I'm not forgetting you. Hey, but, uh, now, listen to me, Weatherby. I want no part of... What kind of an adversary do you call yourself, Deacon? I don't present a sport from you. Now, come below, Deacon. Now is the time to change your luck. Come below, once and for all. <laughs> no. No, I won't go down with you, not down there. Well, you're a diver, aren't you, Deacon? I, I can't. Not in that, that ship. I can't. Oh, blasted, Deacon. I thought at least you'd be amusing. Eh, yeah, very well. When I come back, I'll knock your silly head in. Captain, you want helmet? One thing, Buttermilk. Yes, Captain. You see that fellow white man? Maybe he wants to go below. Good. You give him other suit. Yes, Captain. Maybe... He touch pump or raise fuss. You knock seven bells out of him. Otherwise, no order. You savvy? I savvy, Captain. Good. Now help me with the helmet. Yes. Put on now. You okay now, Captain? You murderer! You filthy murderer with a beat! <laughs> Captain, no here. Not in helmet. You white fella, move away. Captain, go waterside now. You fella, pump plenty good. Captain need much air. Listen, you, I, I've got to talk to you. Captain, see you no good. Hey, look, I'll give you money. Anything, just cut those lines. Captain, die we cut line. No bleed down there. Yes, that's right. He'll die, but I'll pay you more than he will. Line, stop moving, Captain. On ship now. What about it? You want money? No. What do you want? Then I give you anything. You say just cut those lines and leave him. White fella, no good. But don't you understand? He'll kill me after he gets those pearls and comes up. Captain, say no order. Huh? You, you got to listen Go to away. me. Go away. Put me in the longboat, turn me loose. I'll take my chance in the open sea rather than with him. I, I can't stay here. You stay. No, I won't. I won't just wait here like a fool for him to come up and kill me when he pleases. I, I, I'll go down below there with him first and fight it out. You want out a dive suit? Go water side. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I've, got, I've got to think. You nothing. Black fella boy, pump good. Captain need plenty of air down there. And down below, everything went exceeding fine for Captain Weatherby. In a matter of 20 minutes or less, he had found the strong box, broken it open with an iron bar, filled his canvas sack with pearls, and was making his way back towards the companionway through which he had entered the ship. The light was getting stronger as he came back. Then suddenly he stopped. A dim form was facing him. A man as tall as himself, clad in a diving rig. And Weatherby was smiling as he thought, Same type helmet as mine. Same shape. Only other like that is on fancy free. What? Why all that solely? Oh, it's the deacon. <laughs> So you come down, Deacon, after all. So you're going to dispute the prize with me, eh? Claim your vengeance. All right. I was going to kill you one way or the other. One crack on your helmet with this bar, Deacon, and your eardrums are gone. You'll be just an unfortunate diver who drowned while working. But at least you proved an adversary worth his salt. Now... I'm moving at you, Deacon. Good. You move too, eh? We're going to fight it out. Good. A little closer. That's it. Now. Now I'll split your... 
Set out another bottle of rum, Portuguese. I'm cold clean through to the marrow. Five days out there at the wreck, and no thanks from anybody. Not even from the man you brought back? Him? He's crazy as a tick. Calls himself a deacon, a man of the cloth. Look at him over there, sitting alone at the table, talking to himself. Scripture, But it what is. of Captain Weatherby? They said you found his lugger anchored over the wreck. There was two people could have told us that story. One was a deacon, as he called himself, and the other a great hulk of a West African, and he went down after where they'd be never come up. <laughs> you need gear to go that deep. The bleeding crew couldn't manage a word between the lot it of them. It hold out. He hideth his wrong in his heart. Let him be snared in his own pit. In the net which he hid is his own foot taken. Lord, break thou the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Oh, poor fool. He don't know what he's about. Smythe, tell me. What of Weatherby? He found him down the wreck. The pearls all in a great sack tied to his diving belt. And he was drowned. Drowned? His suit had been cut to ribbons by shards of broken glass. Yeah. He was drowned for fair, right inside of his suit. But the glass, Smythe. What was the glass? Oh, a broken mirror. A mirror? It served as a facing for the saloon door leading out of the companionway. It's like he stopped to take a look at himself. Just that one last time. Oh. Well, a toast to, to Captain Weatherby. Rest his soul. The only honest man who came by sea to curse the island. <laughs> Under the direction of Norman MacDonald, Escape has brought you The Adversary by John Russell, specially transcribed for radio by Mr. MacDonald. Featured in the cast were Lawrence Dobkin, John Daner, and Ben Wright, with Alec Harford, Charlie Lung, and Barney Phillips. The narrator was Vic Perrin. Your announcer, George Walsh. The special music for Escape is composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Next week... You are running through the alleys of a Mediterranean village, the blackness of the Italian night confusing you, while somewhere in the dark behind you, coming closer as they search for you, are a man and a beautiful woman who mean to take your life. So listen next week when Escape brings you Kathleen Height's story, An Ordinary Man. This Sunday night, Lionel Barrymore opens the doors to the Hall of Fame, turning the spotlight on another little-known drama of American history whose workings were instrumental in shaping the nation's destiny. Empire builders, dreamers with high ideals, men and women whose pioneering made history. These are the heroes and heroines of the Hall of Fame, starring Lionel Barrymore this Sunday night on most of these same stations. The top dramatic show of them all, the Lux Radio Theater, is heard Monday night on the CBS Radio Network.